Uh, in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the growth of the city of Seattle and how that's tied to the Klondike Gold Rush. Um, so we're really going to be exploring how Seattle became um, kind of the largest and most powerful city in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, in the 1800s, Seattle was just one of the many cities in Washington that were kind of vying for power. Uh, Seattle, Tacoma, Everett, Walla Walla, Mukilteo, Olympia, all these cities um, had advantages and disadvantages about where they were located. And each one of them, you know, was a rival. They were trying to become the most important, most powerful city. Um, Seattle experienced a boom during this time because it started to become a leader in the timber industry. Washington is filled with these massive forests and the lumber from those forests was sent to Seattle and shipped by boat all across the world. Um, it became really important and Washington became a center for the lumber industry in the United States and worldwide. Um, and Seattle really benefited from that. It became a pretty large city. Uh, a lot of people started moving there. It was a timber town but it was still really rough and tumble. Um, most of the buildings were made out of wood. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of development um, aside from you know, a few streets and some entertainment uh, and lumber mills and docks. As Seattle started to grow, uh, more and more people started to come to the area. The building started to become a little bit bigger. Um, all of that changed when the Fire Nation attacked. No, I'm just kidding. It was actually a glue pot. Um, on June 6th, 1889, disaster struck. A massive fire broke out, most likely caused from a pot of melting glue that landed on the floor and burned down one of the uh, wooden buildings in Seattle. And this fire raged for an entire day. Um, it burned the entire city center uh, with the central business district. It burned 25 city blocks, and it destroyed the majority of Seattle's railroad terminals, as well as a lot of its wharfs, its docks. There were some problems um, that Seattle faced during this fire. One of those issues, the reason why it burned for so long and the reason why it destroyed so much property, was because Seattle's pipes to transport the water so that the fire brigades could put it out were also made of wood, and so those pipes burned and the water could not reach the fire. Um, Seattle's buildings were also majority made out of wood, and so those burned very quickly. Um, ultimately, the fire caused approximately about $570 million in today's money in damages, and Seattle would have to rebuild. There was one positive that came out of the fire, though. Uh, Seattle during this time had a massive rat problem, and people in Seattle estimated that it's possible that one million rats were burned during the fire. Um, so fire is good for getting rid of rat problems. As you can see from this picture, you can see that there were some um, stone and brick buildings in Seattle. Um, the shells of those remain here as well. But all the wood buildings in the vicinity of the fire burned to the ground, as well as a lot of the wharfs that you can see here in the background as well. And those are really important for Seattle shipping um, and getting all that lumber out to other people. This fire could have been devastating for Seattle. It could have destroyed the city's prospects at becoming a major city in Washington. But instead, Seattle recovered really quickly. Um, the old wood buildings that burned down were replaced by new ones made out of brick um, that were more fireproof, obviously. Um, in the year following the fire, Seattle's population actually exploded. It grew by up to 40,000 people as people from all across Washington and the country came to help with the rebuilding efforts. It was this boom, this population boom following the fire that actually made Seattle the largest city in Washington. And even importantly, a contender to get really important railroad contracts like the Great Northern Railroad as well. You can see from this drawing, um, this is Seattle in, the 18, in 1890. Um, we can see downtown Seattle here, right in the center of the drawing. Off to our left down here, you can see Alki Beach. Um, 
in this big area over here that is filled in with water, this actually becomes Soto. This is where CenturyLink Stadium and T-Mobile Park are now located today. During that time in Seattle history, that was actually tidal flats and water. Um, only later was that filled in with land um, and became what we know today as CenturyLink Stadium and T-Mobile Park. North of downtown Seattle, over here, across the Mont Lake Cut, we can see the University of Washington. It's actually visible here in this image. A little bit of that right there. Okay. I think this drawing is really interesting because it does show a lot of the modern areas of Washington, right? We can pinpoint some of those locations. We know Lake Union is over here. You know, you look at the neighborhoods of Wallingford and Ballard over in this area as well. West Seattle around Alki Beach. And you can see the entrance to the Duwamish River down here too. So I think that's pretty cool to see. Okay, so after the fire, Instead of being destroyed, Seattle is rebuilt and it actually grows uh, exponentially. In the 1897, another boom strikes Seattle because the ship Portland pulls into port and on that ship, there is a reported $1,139,000 worth of gold from the Klondike. The Klondike was a region that very few people knew about at that time. It was a region way north in the province of the Yukon uh, in Canada. But very quickly, that news spread like wildfire and the gold rush was on. People from across the United States, people from across the world dropped everything that they had and they rushed north to try to get to the gold fields before other people could as well. This is just like what we saw in California um, when people across the United States rushed across the country to move to California to try to uh, strike it rich try to find gold. They do the same here. Right? People are moving north, trying to get to Alaska, trying to get to the Yukon um, in order to become rich. But the news starts in Seattle on July 17th, 1897. Some important terms that I want you to make sure that we understand uh, as we move forward here in this video. One, you need to understand what it means to market something. To market something means to advertise or promote that thing. Right, so an example that we're going to be seeing today is that Seattle marketed itself as the gateway to the Klondike. We already talked about what the Klondike was, but again, remember that is the remote region in the Yukon that this gold rush started. And you're also going to learn about an outfitter. An outfitter is basically a business that sells clothing, equipment, and services, mostly for outdoor activities. Okay. In this image here, you can see a picture of the modern day uh, city of Dawson City in the Klondike. This is the city that becomes kind of the epicenter, the hub of the gold rush in the Klondike region. So here it is today. This is what Dawson City looked like back during the gold rush. And you can see it's mostly just a one-way thoroughfare street with uh, some wood buildings lining it down the side. But you can see there's a massive amount of people crowding the city um, trying to strike here rich and make their fortune. Just like the Oregon Trail, there are all kinds of different routes that miners could take to reach Dawson City um, and to get to the Yukon. If you were rich or wealthy, you could take something called the all-water route. And this was the safest route. You could leave Seattle. You could go across on a steamer ship all the way across the Gulf of Alaska and north to a place called St. Michael and then travel up the Yukon River all the way to Dawson City. Most miners, however, were not rich and they took the Skagway Daea route. So they traveled by steamer ship from Seattle northward along the coast of Canada to two cities, either Skagway or Daea, where they could board um, a boat to those cities and then they would have to hike over the mountains um, in a place called Chilkoot Pass into Canada and then down towards the Yukon. Both of these routes start in Seattle. You can see that from this map. And the city of Seattle works really hard to immediately market itself as the gateway to the Klondike, right? If you're going to get to the Klondike, if you're going to get to the gold fields, you've got to start your journey in Seattle. Um, and people start realizing that all over the world. They start hearing that news, you know, the gateway to the Klondike, Seattle's the gateway. And so people start flocking to Seattle in order to chase the riches up north in the Yukon. So we're going to take a look at what 
the gold rush actually looked like in the Yukon before we focus back at Seattle again. So on the Skagway route, like I said, the miners had to climb over Chilkoot Pass. This was the dividing line between the United States and Alaska and Canada. In order to get across the pass, miners had to haul all of their supplies, all their food, all their mining supplies, all their provisions up and over the pass. So you can see in this uh, image here, this picture, here's the, the camp of all the miners. This is Chilkoot Pass. And that line that you see is actually miners hiking up something called the Golden Staircase. The Golden Staircase was the last mile of the trail to the top of the pass. And the pass rose a thousand feet high and miners in order to reach the top had to climb 1,500 steps that were cut into the ice that the miners called the Golden Staircase. Once they reached the top, there was a giant crowd with all their supplies you can see here in this picture. They've each got their bundles and all their supplies. That was the border crossing between the United States and Canada. And at the border, there were Canadian police waiting for the miners. And what they did at the top is they actually weighed the miners' supplies. So here they are climbing the golden staircase. You can see each man has his supplies on his back as he's climbing the staircase to the top. The Canadian police had very strict regulations on what miners had to bring with them. Each miner had to bring 1,150 pounds of food each. So almost a ton of food on their own, along with their mining gear. So this is going to completely weigh over a ton, and all of it had to be carried to the gold fields. This meant that each miner had to make multiple trips to the top of Chilkoot Pass, and each trip took about a day. So imagine right, how many days it would take to lift all your supplies, all your gear, all your food to the top of that pass. <laughs> Come down, do it again, do it again, do it again. Right? And that's just to get into Canada. Then you still have to go down rivers and lakes and forests all the way to reach the gold fields in the Yukon. Here's some more pictures. Um, you can see, again, here's the miners carrying their gear. And then this is a really good long distance shot of what the uh, golden staircase looked like. All right, you can see all the miners, they look like little ants climbing up the pass. And at the top up here, right, where that border is, there were scales. So the Canadian police would put all your gear on the scales, make sure that they weighed as much as they needed, and then you could move on. So miners, it was very difficult for miners to cheat the system. However, what some miners did is once they passed the scales, they would abandon their supplies and move on with less so that they didn't have to carry as much once they got farther down um, the river after the pass. It's believed that about 100,000 miners tried to make their way to the Klondike. That's a lot. Um, most of these men had to pass through Seattle in order to get there. So this becomes really advantageous for Seattle in order to take advantage of all these miners that are moving their way to the Klondike, right? Because they had to buy that ton of food and gear somewhere. And they really didn't have a lot of opportunities to buy it in Skagway. Smart business owners in Seattle knew this, so they took advantage of it. The Klondike boom was on. In Seattle, people began to open up all kinds of businesses to sell food, supplies, mining gear, anything and everything that you can think of to the miners heading to the Klondike. These were the outfitters, and some of them still exist today. So two companies in Seattle that you may know of, Nordstrom and Filson, both started as outfitters during the Klondike Gold Rush, and they still exist. So what does this mean for Seattle? Right? Seattle is trying to take advantage of this gold rush boom. They're trying to take advantage of all the thousands of people that are passing through their city, having to buy these supplies. So restaurants, hotels, entertainment, shipyards, um, supply chains, retail stores, hotels, right? All these things boom in Seattle during this time. The city grows exponentially as people come uh, to Seattle. Some people come to Seattle and realize that they might be able to make more money in the city than they could in the gold fields, and they choose to stay and open up businesses of their own. 
So Seattle really starts to see a massive benefit and a lot of money and profits coming into the city during this time. And they realize that they need to take advantage of this so that they can continue to benefit from the gold rush for as long as it lasts. So why Seattle? There's other cities that are closer, like Vancouver in Canada. Tacoma is here in the Puget Sound. Right? There are other cities that people could have gone to um, that could have made themselves the gateway to Alaska or to buy their supplies. The Seattle Chamber of Commerce worked really hard to exploit the gold rush and to market Seattle as that gateway to the Klondike. And it was the gold rush that ultimately helped Seattle become bigger and more powerful than those rival cities like Tacoma, Portland, and Vancouver. So how did they do it? They hired a man named Erastus Brainerd to advertise to the world that Seattle was the gateway to Alaska and the only such portal. It was the only way that you could get there and get the supplies that you need. Erastus's Brainerd's advertisements were incredibly successful. They made Seattle famous and people from all over the world began flocking to the city to spend their money and buy supplies or to start businesses there of their own. Here's a quote from Erastus Brainerd in 1897. He said, we are taking advantage of the Klondike excitement to let the world know about Seattle. This event is what put Seattle on the map. This event is what made not only the United States know about this small town in the north of Washington called Seattle, but the world knew about Seattle. Erastus Brainerd created these advertisements and sent them all across the United States and even to other countries, especially Europe. The leader of Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm, even received an advertisement from Erastus Brainerd trying to get them to go to Seattle and make their fortune in Alaska as well. So his advertisements reached a massive amount of people. This is one of these advertisements. You can notice on this advertisement that it shows Seattle as the only route to Alaska. And some of its rival cities don't even appear on the map, right? Here's Seattle. There's no Tacoma. There's not even San Francisco. No Portland, no Vancouver, right? Just Seattle. It's the only way that you can get to Dawson City, whether you're taking the all-water route or the Skagway route. Either way, you're going through Seattle. Narasus Brainerd also said that Seattle is not advertising the Klondike but the Klondike itself is advertising Seattle. So he knew the power of this gold rush. He knew the power of the Klondike and how important it could be to make Seattle famous, to make Seattle important. The Seattle Daily Times in 1898, so kind of near the end of the Klondike gold rush, um, put out this advertisement here. And they said, there's probably no city in the union today so much talked about as Seattle. From every nook and corner of America and from even the outermost parts of the earth, a ceaseless, restless throng is moving, moving toward the land of the midnight sun and precious gold and moving through its natural gateway, the far-famed city of Seattle. So these newspapermen, these advertisers, they knew the power of marketing Seattle as the gateway to riches as the gateway to gold, right? Because that's what people wanted. They wanted to become rich. They wanted adventure, right? They wanted to become wealthy. And if you market Seattle as the way to get there, the fastest, the safest, to get the best supplies, right? More people are gonna come there. More people are gonna come through your city to try to achieve their dreams. We're gonna take a look real quick here at some numbers before we wrap this video up. I want to show you just how much the Klondike Gold Rush helped Seattle grow. Because of the Gold Rush, Seattle grew faster than any other city in the United States from the start of the Gold Rush in 1897 until 1910. It grew from 56,842 people at the beginning of the Gold Rush in 1897 to 237,194 people in 1910. And by that time, Seattle had become the most powerful city in the Pacific Northwest. It far eclipsed its rivals, Tacoma, Portland, and Vancouver, 
It became the economic center of Washington. Um, it became the population center of Washington. And it continued to hold a massive grab on Alaska. You can see here on this uh, chart, comparing Seattle to some other major cities in the United States. So in 1880, Los Angeles had a population of 11,183. Seattle had a population of 3,533. And Washington, D.C. had a relatively massive population compared to the other two of 177,624. In 1910, right, Los Angeles grows to 319,198 people. Washington, D.C. grows to 331,069. And Seattle grows to 237,194. So even though it is not yet as big as these two cities, it has a far larger percentage increase, right? It increases by 6,600%. That is incredible. So in the span of 30 years, Seattle grew from 3,533, basically a sleepy little town on the Puget Sound, to a large city of 237,194 people. And that's largely responsible because of the gold rush. The gold rush is what brought people to Seattle. The gold rush is what made the world learn and know about Seattle. The gold rush helped bring important railroad contracts to the city so that Seattle could receive more people, more goods, more supplies quicker. However, even after this population boom, Seattle still relied on extractive industries, right? Things that take out of the earth. So mining, lumber, fishing, and agriculture for its economy. And as long as Seattle would rely on extractive industries, it would be subject to booms and busts, depending on you know, how well those things were selling or what the supply of them looked like or the prices in the market. And so it was only later on in the 1900s that Seattle began to adapt its industries. And we'll take a look at that in another video later on as Seattle looks instead not to the forests or to the Puget Sound, but instead to the sky and the stars for its industries and its growth. So check back in later. Um, for another video. I hope you learned something new and interesting, and I hope that this video helps explain a little bit about how the Klondike Gold Rush helped Seattle grow. Thank you for listening, and I will see you later.